All right. Um, well, if you have a Bible, open it up to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And today, um, the title of the message is Spiritual Wisdom. Spiritual Wisdom, which God has given to every believer in Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, um, last time in the first five verses, we'll be, we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 6. Last, last time in the first five verses... Um, Paul was telling the church in Corinth about how uh, when he came to them and preached to them uh, that he didn't come with excellence of speech or of wisdom. Um, in fact, he said, my speech and my preaching were not with the persuasive words of human wisdom. He said, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This was the message. Paul brought to the Corinthians. And it was through their believing the message of Christ crucified for their sins that they were saved and that they became members of the church and were joined together. But since their conversion, um, division had crept in among, among them and many were falling back into their old ways. They were relying on human wisdom. They were pledging allegiance to human leaders. You remember some of them were saying, I am of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas. They were divided. And what this attitude revealed in them is that they had lost sight of the fact that the gospel is the power and the wisdom of God. And that it was not through human wisdom, nor was it through their own power that they had become Christians, but it was God who had given them new life through Jesus Christ and his atoning death on the cross. And you know, we need to remember that. How did I get saved? Did I work really hard? Did I, was it because I'm just so smart that I was able to somehow come to this understanding that I needed God or that, you know, that I'm a sinner or whatever it is or that was I accepted with God because I'm just so wonderful? No. It was God's mercy that brought you to Christ. It was the mercy of God that opened your eyes to your need for a Savior. And it was that Savior's death on Calvary that opened the door for you to be saved, for your sins to be forgiven. That's why you're here today sitting here. That should be the reason why. And the Corinthians had lost sight of that. They had forgotten who they were before. In chapter 6 here of 1 Corinthians after listing some of the terrible sins and lifestyles that they had all been guilty of, Paul reminded them that they had been washed. They had been sanctified. They had been justified from their sins in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. God had given to them newness of life when they believed in Jesus Christ. And God was wanting them to grow in that newness of life He had given them. But their continued reliance on human wisdom, they're going back to the ways of the world, was impeding their spiritual growth and it was causing disunity in the church. And so, as I told you when we started the book, this is a corrective letter. It was written by Paul to correct the church, to correct the carnality and the worldliness that existed in their lives and in the church. And so, as we pick it up in verse 6, Paul here begins to speak on the subject of spiritual wisdom. Spiritual wisdom, which is contrary to the world's wisdom. In fact, the world could never, ever understand God's wisdom. Look with me at verse 6. Paul said, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. Notice that. What does Paul say about the rulers of this age? The, the men in high places, the governing authorities, the rich and the famous and the wealthy, those outside of Christ. He tells us they're coming to nothing. Coming to nothing. 
Peter said, all fle- the Bible, well, Peter quoting from the Old Testament, said, all flesh is grass. The wind blows on it. It fades away. It doesn't last. All the glory of this world is passing away. It's coming to nothing. And so the wisdom Paul was speaking of was not the wisdom of the world. It's not the wisdom of this age that we live in. It's so important that we understand that. It's something completely new, something completely different. It's of God. It's of His Holy Spirit. It's of His Word. It's the treasures and the riches. In fact, Paul told the Colossians that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, guess where they are found? In Christ. All of them. The whole thing. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall rest upon his shoulders, the prophet declared. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Found in him, this one person, the Christ child. And yet, he's, he's ignored by most of the world. And he's sadly ignored in many churches that have become worldly. And this was one of them, being ignored. They were relying on the wisdom of this age, which Paul said is coming to nothing. God help us all to not rely on human wisdom. Now, the word age here refers to historic age. So uh, Paul was speaking not only of the historical period in which he lived, but of all periods of human history. So the wisdom he spoke of was not the wisdom of the world in any human period, any period of human history. James tells us that the wisdom of this world, you know where it actually finds its origin? The devil, demonic, selfish, it's self-centered wisdom. It's wisdom all based on me, all on my wants and desires. But that's not the wisdom that comes from God. And so Paul here is telling them, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Look at verse 7 and 8. Paul said, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So the wisdom of God, as I've been saying, it's hidden from the world and from the rulers of this world. From the governing, you know, the governing authorities, as I've said, and the leading men, for the most part, have always had no regard uh, for God's wisdom revealed in Jesus Christ. If they did, as Paul said, certainly they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Jesus was rejected at his first coming, especially by those in power. Um, Paul said back in chapter 1, to the Jews, he's a stumbling block. To the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who have been called by God through the gospel, Paul said back in chapter 1, verse twenty. 3 and 24, he said, But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. Verse 24, But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Those who are called. Who are those people? Who's the called? Thus, believers. Those who have believed in Jesus Christ. Again, you didn't make yourself a Christian. God chose you. He called you. He opened your eyes. He revealed this hidden wisdom that to the world is foolishness, but to you it's everything. Why? Because He called you. Jesus said, No man comes to me except the Father who sent me draws him. The work of the Spirit. You didn't come to this understanding on your own. In fact, in verse 9, Paul's quoting from the Old Testament. He says, I is not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him it never entered into your heart it never that this thought never came into your mind that god would send his only begotten son to be a man and to die on a roman cross this is not something that any of us came to an understanding on our own wisdom of god it was the spirit of god who opened our eyes to it and so for those who've been called christ the power of god and the wisdom of God, and as the ones who recognize Christ and the message of Him 
crucified for our sins, these are the ones, again, to whom the wisdom of God has been revealed. And these are the ones who, in God's eyes, are mature, have understanding. Paul said at the beginning of verse 6, we speak wisdom among those who are mature. You're, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you're mature. You're more mature than anybody else who doesn't know him. I don't care what position they have in life. I don't care how much money they make. I don't care how much power they have. I don't care how much influence they have. They don't understand. To them, the message of the cross is foolishness. But you who believe, you are mature. Now, obviously, we are not all at the same level of maturity in our relationship with the Lord. That's, you know, we're all at different places in our walk with Christ. But one thing that every believer has in common is the belief that salvation and redemption from sin is through completely trusting in Jesus Christ and his finished and perfect sacrifice on the cross. We all have that in common. We all believe that. Every believer understands this truth, regardless, again, of how mature or immature he or she may be in the faith. Every genuine Christian knows that the cross of Christ is the only place to find forgiveness and cleansing from sin. Every Christian knows that. So, Paul said here, these are the ones we speak God's wisdom among because they're the ones who receive it. Again, to everyone else, this message is foolishness, the message of the cross. And so, you know, a person's view of Christ and the cross really says it all, doesn't it? And it tells me everything I need to know about them and where they stand in relation to God. You know, if, if a person can say with the, with the hymn writer, Rock of Ages cleft for me, if, if they can say this, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. Listen, if a person can say that, there's no doubt they're a believer. They understand the wisdom and the power of God that Paul is talking about here. No doubt, they've grasped the truth of the gospel. But if someone is trusting in something else, or if they're adding anything else to the message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified for our sins, as also necessary for salvation, then they have not grasped the truth of the gospel. They have not grasped it. They are not a believer. If they are trusting in the church, trusting in confirmation from a priest, trusting in the sacraments, trusting in maybe the mediation, the intercession of the Virgin Mary or the saints, etc., etc., alongside of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, then again, they are not believers. They have not understood the gospel message of justification by faith and personal trust on the part of the individual towards Christ and Him alone. This is foundational to us. And yet so many are confused about it even today. So many Christians don't even know the difference between um, some of these doctrines that I'm talking about. Listen, a person's response to Christ and the cross says it all. If you can say, my hope is built on nothing less, in Jesus' blood and righteousness, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Listen, you're a believer. You're saved. You've grasped the truth. You've seen your need. But to all the rest, it's a foolish message because they're still trusting in themselves or in other things. They're not building on the rock like we were talking about during the time of worship, but they're building on the sand. And so Paul is saying here, the wisdom we're speaking, it's not of this age. It's not of the rulers of this age. Reject it. And then he goes on, verse 9 to 12, to tell of how those in Corinth, and I've touched on this already, but we'll talk about it again, how those in Corinth had come to understand God's wisdom revealed in Christ. Let's read verse 9 to 12 uh, in its entirety. 
Paul said, but as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. How did you come to understand this truth I've been talking about of Jesus Christ and Him crucified for your sins? It didn't enter it into your heart because it hasn't entered into the, any man's heart. No one understands it naturally. In fact, Paul's going to tell us in verse 14, the natural man does not receive the things of God. How is it that you did? God revealed them to you. He chose you. He opened your heart to the truth. He showed you your need. And that's what Paul is saying here to them. You know, you didn't come to the understanding of the gospel on your own through your superior power of intellect. So why are you living like that now? Why are you comparing each other, yourselves with one another? Why are you lining up around teachers? Why are you dividing? For you all have the same crucified Savior. You all share the same faith. You all came to God through the same way. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So what makes you differ from one another is basically what Paul is teaching here. It was, and it was the Spirit of God who even enabled you to believe the truth. Because left to yourself, you wouldn't even believe it. In fact, Jesus said, men love darkness rather than light. That's every man by nature. Men love darkness rather than light. That's why men don't want this message. It's an affront to their pride. It's an affront to their sin. They're, they're enemies and they're opposed to God. Paul said in the book of Romans that the carnal mind is, is enmity against God. It's not subject to his law. It can't be. So you, you had a change of nature. And it was the Spirit of God who did the work. He revealed the truth of the gospel to them. And what the Spirit did is he bore witness to Paul's message in Corinth. Showed them their own personal need for Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then the Spirit showered God's free love and grace upon them when they believed. This is the work of the Spirit. He not only convinces the sinner, brings him to repentance, but then he pours the love and the grace and the forgiveness of God upon the sinner who believes in the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so I ask you this morning, have you believed that message for yourself? Do you see your need for a crucified Savior or not? This is the dividing line for all of us. And it reveals what I'm really trusting in, where I'm putting my hope. Am I putting my hope in myself, my own good works, maybe my own you know, church membership, how many years I've been a part of the church, you know, how many years I've Maybe what have I done throughout my whole life? You know, I've been a, I've been a good citizen. Keep, you know, we all innately trust in things that we shouldn't. We fall back upon these things that, that like the song says, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus. The Spirit of God convinces us of these things, and then he frees us from our sins and ourselves gives us joy, gives us the things that God has freely given to us. And notice, Paul said, free. It's a free gift. Salvation's a gift. I don't earn it. I don't work for it. God gives it to those who believe. So that's what Paul's telling the Corinthians. You know, if we're established in this truth, boy, you better believe that brings unity. Because I can't go around boasting about the great things I've done. <laughs> I can't go around bragging about what a wonderful person I am. No. I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I don't deserve to be here, but God called me to be here. He revealed these things to me. Paul's reminding the Corinthians of this. Now, Jesus told the disciples in John's Gospel that this would be the way things would go. You remember he said in John... Speaking of the Holy Spirit, this is from Christ. He said, when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. 
The Spirit of God convicts. What, is, what does conviction mean? It mean to be convicted. Basically, it means to be convinced. I'm guilty. You know, when, when a person stands trial, right? Before a jury. The jury reads the verdict. Guilty or not guilty? Basi- guilty, right? If you've, been, if you've been found guilty, you're convicted of a crime. So the Spirit of God convicts the world of their sin, of the righteous standard of God, which, they've all, which we've all fallen short of, also of the judgment that is to come. God is going to judge the world. The Bible is clear on that subject. And so the Spirit seeks to convince man, to convict him of his guilt, to show him his need, but it's all to bring man to Christ, into the cross. And Jesus told the disciples also that the Spirit would guide them into all truth, the disciples. And notice, as we looked at in verse 11, Paul compared the Spirit's knowledge of God to that of a human being's own knowledge of him or herself. And he did that to illustrate something that's very important. And it's this. No one is more qualified to reveal God's thoughts and mind than God's own Holy Spirit. Here's here's the, the logic. Just as no one knows another person better than they know themselves, right? So no one knows God better than he knows himself. No one knows God better than he knows himself. God has given to us his own Holy Spirit who alone knows the depths of God, who alone knows those innermost thoughts of God, God has given to us His own Spirit. Think of that. God, God wants to dwell inside of you, reveal to you all the things that are yours in Jesus Christ. Freely given to you. God couldn't get any closer to you than sending His own Holy Spirit to go to your spirit. This is amazing stuff. You think about it. We're talking about the creator of the universe, God Almighty, coming to you and talking to you personally from his own spirit. Think of those innermost thoughts that only you know about yourself. And we all know. No one knows you better than you. No one knows me better than me. Not even my own wife knows me better than myself. Who knows God better than he knows himself? And he has communicated to you the truth from his own Holy Spirit self. That's an amazing truth. That's amazing love. That shows the, how God wants to be close to you. No. And so, I like what John MacArthur said about this. He said, wonder of wonders. It is the Spirit of God, the one who intimately knows the depths of God and the thoughts of God, whom God has sent to reveal his own wisdom to those who believe. Wonder of wonders. You know, we, we, we focus a lot on the coming of Christ, as we should this time of year. But do we focus on the coming of the Spirit? Christ died so that we could receive the Spirit, God's own Holy Spirit in our hearts. That's what it means to be born again, spiritually made alive. Whereas once you were dead in your trespasses and your sins, now you've come alive unto God. You have a personal relationship with Him through God's own Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. And He's the one who guides into the truth. Now, the, the disciples, of course, were the first ones. They later became apostles, and Jesus told them that the Spirit would guide them into all truth. Jesus told them that the Spirit would bring to their remembrance all things that He had said to them. And so they, in turn, delivered to us God's word. And those in the church in Corinth had received it through Paul and others. And so um, Paul, speaking of the revelation of the gospel, made known in the New Testament, look what he said in verse 13. Speaking to the Corinthians about spiritual wisdom, Paul said, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So the wisdom we have is 
not from man, but it's from God's own Holy Spirit. These are the things, Paul said, that we're talking to you about. You know, the revelation of Christ in the New Testament, listen, it's the final revelation of God to man. It was given by God's own Holy Spirit, and it is the very Word of God. That's why we stay in the Bible here. Every church should. Because I could stand in this pulpit and give you human wisdom. I don't have a lot, I can tell you that, so you probably wouldn't come. (laughs) Because I don't have much to share. There's not a lot going on up here as far as that. (laughs) That's why I stay in here. This is where I'm safe. But I don't we don't focus on human wisdom because it can't really help you. You can't grow spiritually, you can't grow in your knowledge of God. It hasn't entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. I have nothing to say of myself. But this book has lots to say about it. And so Paul said, These are the things we speak to those who are mature, to those who receive it. The Word of God. Paul told Timothy, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And what that literally means is this. The Word of God, the Bible, was literally God-breathed. That's what spirit means. Wind. God, when, when He created Adam, we read that God breathed in him the breath of life. God breathed His word through the apostles. They wrote it down in the New Testament. God's given to you His Holy Spirit and He's given to you His word. What more do you need? What more can I ask for? People say, oh, well, why doesn't God just reveal Himself? He has. But it's hidden from this age except for those who are called. God breathed. Came, the Word of God, it came to, to completely through the revelation of God's Holy Spirit as He directed the apostles concerning the things that had been freely given to us by God, which they recorded for us in the New Testament. And so, let me just say this. The way to grow in God's wisdom and to gain spiritual understanding and wisdom is to compare, as Paul said in verse 13, Spiritual things with spiritual. Compare. So what does he mean by that? How do I compare spiritual things with spiritual? Well, there's a couple meanings you could draw out of this. Number one, I would say, all the different books of the Bible. Correlating them together. Comparing one to another. Comparing the writings of Paul with the writings of Peter, the writings of James, the writings of John, the Gospels. It's like, a, it's like a puzzle, right? Anybody here like to do puzzles? I don't. <laughs> I hate them, but, but, I, like, but I like this puzzle. <clears throat> this is a puzzle that I, I enjoy as I read it, as I think on it. And, you know, as I pr- even, this will affect your prayer life. Praying Scripture. Thinking on Scripture when you pray. You know, Paul said that the, to the Romans, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How's that going to happen? Compare spiritual things with spiritual. Another thing I would say about this is test everything by what this book says. Don't just, but John the Apostle said, Beloved, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits. Well, how do I do that? I need to know what the Word says. I need to know what's been written. Remember Jesus, when he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness, when the tempter came to him with a lie, Jesus said, it is written. That's how he combated those spiritual attacks. That's how he, was, he shed light on what was true. You need to know what's written. You need to compare spiritual things with spiritual. And listen, the more Scripture you know, the more, the more of an opportunity will God the Holy Spirit have to instruct you, to bring to your remembrance the Scriptures you know. This is why you should come to Bible study every Wednesday night. <clears throat> you know? Think of it like an investment in your spiritual life. Now, we all invest in a lot of things in our lives, right? We invest in our families. We invest in ourselves, mostly. We invest our money, invest in our homes. But let me ask you, how are you, are you investing in your spiritual life? Relationship with God? Are you comparing spiritual things with spiritual? 
Do you know what is written? Well, a good way to start is come to Bible study on Wednesday night. You know, we're going through the Old Testament. We're just going a book at a time, a verse at a time. We're covering everything. And that's so wise to do because, as Paul said, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's all God-breathed. It's all profitable. It's all able to make you wise. And, it, and listen, as you're in the Word of God, the Holy Spirit will then be able to instruct you from His Word because He's the author of the book. And He will give you a fuller understanding of God's plan of redemption. Maybe you don't understand it that way. I went through years like that where I struggled to grasp the gospel. But it takes perseverance. It takes endurance. And so we should compare spiritual with spiritual. These are the things that we need. Verse 14, then Paul said, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So the natural man, who's that? That's the unbeliever. The person who does not know Christ. The person in whom the Holy Spirit does not dwell. They don't receive the things of the Spirit of God. And here's why. The natural man has no inner capacity to grasp God's truth. Because he or she is spiritually dead in trespasses and sins. That's Ephesians chapter 2. The natural man is dead in trespasses and sins. Dead to God, separated from God, and thus they live by the only thing they know, which is this, their own thoughts, their own wisdom, their own viewpoint. And they see no need or value in the things of God and the gospel. Again, the gospel's foolishness to this person, the natural man. But on the flip side, look at verse 15, Paul said, but he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. The believer is not like that. The believer judges all things. The believer compares spiritual with spiritual. The believer's in the Word of God. The believer understands the Bible, not fully, okay, but they sense that it's His Word. They sense the truth in it, the truth of it. And the Spirit of God applies it to their life. It's, you know, it's, it's as, as Jesus said to the devil when he was tempted, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now the natural man thinks life's just about bread alone. Right? Oh, I just live by, it's just about what I'm going to eat, what I'm going to drink, what I'm going to wear. You know, just the, the means of life. But the spiritual man lives on a much different plane. We live in the realm of the Spirit, the realm of God. And we know that life is not just about bread, physical bread. No, true life is the bread of life, which is Jesus Christ. Spirit is far superior to the material. The spiritual man judges all things. He understands these things. But the natural man is foolishness. God? What would I need God for, right? <clears throat> if I care. Blind, dead, and trespasses and sins. Unaware of the fate that, the, that he's headed towards, which is an eternity without God, without Christ. Eternal darkness. Jesus described hell as a place of weeping, gnashing of teeth, where the worm doesn't die, where the fire's never quenched. This is where the natural man is headed, but the spiritual man, no, he judges all things. But then Paul said the last part, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. What does that mean? <clears throat> well, that means this. Just as the world cannot understand the gospel, as we've been talking about, doesn't receive it, neither can they understand the Christian who believes the gospel. You know, to the world, the Christian is an enigma. You're rightly judged by no one. Now the world thinks they know how to judge Christians. They, you know, we're foolish in their eyes. And what are you going to church for all the time? You know, Why don't you come out and 
to the bars and to the clubs with us and party. Why don't you come on over and, you know, why don't you just relax a little bit and loosen up, right? But they don't understand. This is all foolishness to them because they can't receive it because, again, they're dead in their trespasses and sins. They don't know the Lord. And so don't be surprised if the world doesn't understand you. Don't be surprised if your unsaved friends don't get you. Or if there's uh, um, a rift sometimes between you. There's tension. That's, it's because you're living in two different worlds. They're living outside of Christ. They're living away from God. God's in none of their thoughts. They're living to please the flesh. They put themselves first and their own desires. Whereas you, in Christ, you're alive to God. You have the Spirit of God. You have, a, you have newness of life. You know the Word of God. You have a good working conscience. So don't be surprised. All the world is really divided into one of two camps. The saved and the unsaved. And so, Paul said, He who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. Verse 16, closing here. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. What a verse that is. We have the mind of Christ right here. You want to know his mind? You can know it. Now, God's mind again to the world is a mystery. And you know, the world has their slogans. He works in mysterious ways. <laughs> Big man upstairs. Because they don't understand. They don't know him like you do. And the reason they can't know it, again, is because, as Paul said, these things are spiritually discerned. But for those of us who have come to Christ and have understood that his death was for our sins, we have received God's Spirit. And listen, we have the very mind of Christ. We are meant to live in. I want to live in his mind. What's his mind? What does he think? What would he, you know, that slang, what would Jesus do, right? Well, it's all written here for us. You want to know what he would do? This, Bible, this word will tell you. And it will tell you what you should do as his follower. The mind of Christ is all revealed to us in the scriptures. And the Holy Spirit who lives in us enables us to comprehend the scriptures. And so, the more time we spend studying God's word, the more we will understand God's wisdom in Christ and the more we will come into line with God's will for our lives. You know what the will of God is? Get into his mind. Get into his word. Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Get into his mind. And let his mind get into you. And as you do, your life will come into line with now, it won't always be easy. It's going to be a battle. Because we still have a fallen nature that fights against his mind. <laughs> and we all, by, we all are prone to want to exalt our own wisdom, right? Above God's. I mean, anyone else struggle with that? I sure do. Lord, I know you said this, but, you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> trust, you know, trust me. Right? That's what the Lord tells us to do. And, you know, as we do... That's where the place of peace is. I'm able to let go of my ways. I'm able to let go of my thoughts. I'm to, and I start trusting His. And I start getting in line with Him. And that's when I start to really enjoy fellowship with God. That relationship with Him. And I walk in obedience to Him. And I let my guard down. And I, I start loving other people. And I start you know, thinking of ways I can serve God on a daily basis. Ways I can please Him. I ask him to help me in prayer. Do please him. Get into his mind. But on the other side of that, listen guys, if we neglect the scriptures, like the Corinthians were doing, then what do we have left? Just our own natural thoughts to live by, which I, we all know are not from the Spirit of God. I don't want to live by my own wisdom. And if we live by our own wisdom, it won't be long 
before we become spiritually barren and unfruitful. I want to leave you with Proverbs 3, chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Solomon there said this, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. You could also say your own wisdom. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. That's the will of God for each of us. That our faith would grow, our trust in Him would grow, that we'd lead, we would lean on His wisdom and not our own, that we'd grow in this newness of life that He's given to us in Christ, that we would get into His mind. Oh, He's given us His mind. He's given us His own spirit who will reveal to us deep things of God, those, those things that He's freely given to us. And so that's my encouragement for you this week. Get into His mind. Get into His Word. Spend time alone with God in prayer. Maybe you've came, maybe you're troubled. Maybe you're struggling with things in life. Problems at home. Problems with family. Problems at work. Problems with your health. We all have got, we all, each of us have problems we're facing. But the answer is always the same. We have the mind of Christ. So God help us to put it on. Set our, our, um, our compass, if you will, that direction. And as we do, God will bless. We will grow. God's going to do great things. So that's where I leave it. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for your word. <clears throat> And help us, Lord, to really take to heart what we heard this morning. Lord, we need to change, each, each and every one of us, Lord. And it's not you who need to change, it's we who need to change, Lord. You are the Holy One, the great I Am. So God, help us to get in line with your wisdom. Help us not to live like the world does, Lord. Help us to grow. And um, I pray this week that we would get into your mind as these things have been freely revealed to us through your spirit, by your word. And we thank you and praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand.